namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhassa aparuta te sangamata sadwara yeso tavanto pamanchantu sadha so this evening i wanted to share with you some of my uh, experiences and reflections about my uh, recent trip to Bodhgaya as a bit of a pilgrimage. Many, some of you may have been on pilgrimages or trips to India before. Many people travel around backpacking around India and so on. A couple of times before I've been on <coughs> these very kind of whirlwind pilgrimages. Where you, well, last time we went with a bunch of Singaporeans and you'd go boom, 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 straight around. It's like 12 hours traveling, one hour at the holy site, right? right that's it, get in the bus, nine o'clock, off. And uh, that's it, you got your photos, got your snaps, let's go. And then I came back and I said, never again. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least not until they fix the roads up or something happens. Um, so this time uh, I got the invitation in December to go to Bodh Gaya and uh, they needed a uh, Dhamma speaker and so they couldn't get the ones they actually wanted so they had to end up with me. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> so, anyway, I don't, I don't think they, any of them knew who I was, so that was all right. And uh, I didn't know who they were either, so that was, that was mutual. And, you know, it was, it was one of these things where I really just didn't know what, what I was getting myself in for, so I just sort of went. <coughs> and um, on the way, because now you can fly into Gaia from Bangkok, so... Uh, I'd stopped over in Thailand and had the very good uh, fortune to visit my teacher, Ajahn Mahachachai, in, in Bangkok. And uh, always very, very lovely. I hadn't seen him for about four years. I haven't been back in Thailand for four years. So always very, very lovely to see him. He's a very, very <coughs> lovely monk. And uh, very, uh, very humble, very content monk. He's, uh, he's just doing the same thing. He does not... He's not kind of, um, you know, he's not selling himself or anything like that. And uh, but, you know, I just have to admit, of all the monks that I know, I mean, and, and the monks that I've met all the time, I was in Thailand. You know, when I listen to him talk about Dhamma, then then, uh, you know, he's, he gives the best Dhamma teachings, the best meditation teachings of anyone that I met when all my time in Thailand, and uh, very. Uh, you know, this is this beautiful kind of balance. You know, this is one of the things he's taught me is this kind of balance of being, you know, very intelligent and and uh, knowledgeable, but also, you know, being very firmly grounded on experience and on, on, on metta. And to get this kind of balance right is very rare, very hard to find. And uh, so this time when I was talking... You know, we were talking and so on. He talked a lot, a lot about um, emptiness this time when we were talking. And... Um, Yeah, he was very interested in what we're doing here and so on. But then, you know, he sort of, he has this very kind of, very, very subtle way, you know, he's starting out this kind of chit-chat and what he'd been doing and so on. And then, you know, he's very interested in, you know, starting the monastery and all of these kinds of things. And then he sort of gradually works it around to these kind of deeper and deeper dhammas as he's going. And then he ended up with emptiness, you know. And he said, like, when there's true emptiness, everything's gone. He said, the mind's gone, there's nothing there. He, he's just complete. That's this, this is like this kind of true emptiness. And he says, he says, this, he says, this, this emptiness is not. It's not like an absence or a, a um, uh, lack. It's not a lack or something, but it's a fulfilment. It's a consummation. And uh, he said, that everything's gone. The mind's gone. There's no mind. There's no chit. <coughs> he said, this is what they. This, I said, has it, you know, because I'm because I'm cheeky. <coughs> And then I said, well, how do you know that? If the mind's not there, how do you know that experience? How do you know that? So he just said, oh, it's not a theory. <laughs> it's not some theory. This is an experience. You have to practice it. So, I went from there up to what Nanachat to see my old uh, monasteries where I ordained and uh, trained for a few years. 
so I hadn't been back there for a number of years. I have a, I have always had for many years a very, um, how shall I put this tactfully, ambiguous relationship with Wat Manachat. And, uh, you know, of course I'm very grateful because it's a place that inspired me to go forth and where I got my basic training and so on. Uh, and yet I think there are some very, very deep problems and issues with the place which, which uh, I don't think have really been addressed or really been looked at. And uh, so it was kind of a interesting, interesting experience in that way. But there, you know, there were some things which I felt made me, in a sense, I could see, you know, ways that things were being done and so on, which were quite different from what we're trying to do at Santi, uh, and in ways that confirmed me or gave me more confidence that, that, you know, we were doing the right thing, at least for us. I mean, I don't want to kind of try to judge or tell other people what they should be doing, but I could see, that, you know, some things are just not right for me. I mean, one of the things that I noticed was... Um, a degree of inequality among the monks, especially the senior monks. You know, you see these, the kutis and so on that are being built, the monks' huts are these huge and very, you know, very luxurious kind of places that are built for, for the senior monks. And then, you know, there's a kind of a new, what they call Ajahn Sumedho kuti, which, you know, Ajahn Sumedho, of course, lives in, Thai, in England. He's only going to visit there a couple of few days a year. And uh, they built this very, very expensive kuti for him. And, you know, and the monks still living in very simple wooden huts with just a tin roof, not even a ceiling or anything on the tin roof. You know, this is where the monks are living. And was, uh, to me, it's just not right. I mean, it's not, it's not Vinaya. It's not, it's not what the Buddha was about. And so I can't, you know, even though much of I respect, you know, the monks and so on, it's their choice to do these things, but I can't uh, agree... And it just seemed to me quite problematic in terms of creating a community and creating a dynamic within a community that, that the whole purpose of Sangha is that there isn't. You know, just Sangha is Sangha. We just have a robe. Oh, we're the same robe. You know, we're not like, you know, in, in the Catholic Church where you become a bishop or something and you get like a nice purple one and you get a big ring and so on. We don't have those kinds of things. It's just a robe, you know. The haircut is just the haircut, you know. You just do the haircut and that's it, you know. And we're not into status symbols and things like that, but, but these kind of differentiation and so on between the, the monks and that just seemed to me quite, just very problematic and, and uh, unnecessary. So this was one, uh, one kind of problem. And of course the other, the other problem which became a bit of a theme of my trip was about women and how women are treated and thought of and so on. And I had a Q&A session with the monks and the novices and lay people and so on and ended up going till quite late at night and they ended up asking me all these questions about bhikkhunis and women's role in Buddhism and all of these kinds of things. And they, they'd never, I mean, the things I was saying, they'd never heard anything like it, you know. And it was just like, these are like taboo issues. They never kind of get discussed. They never get aired. And it's like it's, like it's almost, it's just not relevant you know they're blokes hey you know i'm a bloke i've got my kuti people come and give me food what's the problem you know and i've been supported in my practice so if no one actually if you don't actually make it conscious then it remains unconscious and it remains unaddressed and it remains unsolved and you know i could see that among the young people there who were just coming along that you know it was an issue they were troubled at what were the roles available for women, how they were treated, and so on. And, you know, they, they raised concerns to me. I didn't, you know, raise any particular or specific concerns. I, mean, I, I was just sort of speaking in support of uh, bikinis and, and um, making, the, making that available for all people, regardless of gender, making ordination available. And, uh, but, you know, they would raise various problems and things that they'd seen. And so again, this I think was quite, they didn't have, I don't think they had a context or, or, or a way of, of making that, doing anything about it. And so I think ultimately, you know, if you stay within that, that system, which is probably quite common among the, the, the Sangha in general, then basically you either capitulate and sort of go over to the fairly chauvinist majority viewpoint, or else you just kind of get out and become a bit of a rebel because there's no opportunity for a dialogue within that kind of environment. So this was 
these were some of the things that that uh, you know I noticed when I when I was there, just in my short time there. So, uh, but these did become themes for me. So <coughs> I left now, flew into Gaia, and uh, was met by the organizing committee of these chanting ceremonies. So what we were actually going for was to chant the Pali Canon. And those of you who know anything about the Pali Canon know that it's fairly big and that you can't hope to chant the whole thing in just 12 days or 10 days. or I think it was only 10 days it ended up... No, probably 12 days. So what they're doing is they've, they've organized a ceremony and the initial inspiration of it came from a monk called... Venerable Sivali, who's the uh, bhikkhu in charge of the Mahabodhi Society at uh, Bodh Gaya. And a uh, very, very lovely monk. And uh, he had this inspiration to do this and had talked to various people. And no one had, everyone had basically said, it's impossible, it'll never happen. You know, what are you wasting your time doing this? Uh, and no one's ever going to, you're never going to find a sponsor and so on. Meanwhile, in America, there's a, uh, one of these Tibetan Rinpoche called Tatang Tulku who I know fairly little about, but he's apparently quite a remarkable teacher and has many projects and so on going. He's got this kind of small empire going. And they've been organizing for years the Tibetan Mon Lam, the, the big chanting ceremony in January in Bodh Gaya. If any of you have been there in January, you'll have seen these kind of rivers of thousands of Tibetan monks and nuns going along there for the chanting ceremony. And uh, so they've organized that for the last 20-something years, 25 years. And so he decided that they needed to do something to help the Theravadan Sangha. So even they're from, though they're from Tibetan tradition, and he asked his daughter, uh, Wang Mo Dixi, and uh, their organization, Light of Buddha Dhamma Foundation, to help to reestablish and to, to, to cultivate the Theravadan Sangha in India. It's quite a, a very remarkable thing. And so by some strange vagaries of fate, what some people call coincidence, but we know better, these two groups came together and uh, Venerable Sivali had an idea for doing the chanting ceremony and, but needed a sponsor. The other guys wanted to sponsor something and help something, but they didn't know what to sponsor. So they came together and they started last year, uh, had the ceremony and invited the monks from all the different Theravadan countries, Thailand, uh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Cambodia. And this year, uh, they just, this was the second time that they'd done it. And so it was held from the 12th till the 22nd of February. And it will be these dates, same dates every year uh, in Bodh Gaya. Uh, and this year we chanted the Diga Nikaya. And so they actually printed for free distribution the Diga Nikaya in Pali and then gave a copy to all of the 300 monks who were there and a, a few nuns as well. But um, And each year as we do, some, do more, they'll print up the, what we're doing each year and then give it out. So, so what the chanting ceremony consisted of, I was a bit, I was a bit kind of suspicious when we started because I thought, oh God, it's going to be all of these awful ceremonies and people giving all these pompous speeches and titles and all of this rubbish, I'm going to hate it. So I didn't necessarily go there with the best attitude, but very luckily it wasn't like that at all. And uh, they said apparently it was a bit like that last year when they did it because uh, the Dalai Lama opened it last year and that meant that all the, 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 the hangers-on and everything trying to get near the Dalai Lama and everyone trying to sort of hog the stage and blah, blah, blah. So that's why they didn't, didn't have him to, there this year. And uh, so it was pretty straightforward and pretty simple. And um, <coughs> they, what they did is they set up different pavilions in different parts around the main temple in Bodh Gaya. So there's one, temple, one pavilion for the Thais, another pavilion for the... Uh, Burmese, another one for the Cambodians, and then the main one underneath the Bodhi tree itself was the Indian, Bangladeshi, and Sri Lankan Sangha. And so they're all chanting in their different styles. And one of the aspirations of the organizing committee was to eventually somehow be able to get everyone actually chanting together. Right? 
because because everyone has these national styles of chanting. It's very hard if you've grown up in a culture where you've just done this from your birth, and that's all. That's what Pali sounds like, you know, to actually get them together and be able to chant. And they're very different. It's not just the chanting style is different, but also the pronunciation is very very different. And if you hear some of them, you know, like the the um, the Thais have their kind of style, which is a bit like this chanting style that we we use here. It's a bit influenced by the Thai style, and uh, the Burmese style is perhaps not totally euphonious. I'll, I'll try to refrain from doing an imitation of the Burmese style, but aesthetic pleasingness was not a priority in, in designing that style. I'm not quite sure why. I mean, the Burmese have a very exquisite aesthetic taste in many things. Many beautiful Buddha images and all of these things come from Burma, but they haven't extended that to developing their chanting style <laughs> yet, unfortunately. So... <clears throat> Uh, and then under the, under the main group, there was usually, in the main group there was about 150 monks or so under the Bodhi tree. And they were led by a monk called uh, Bhante uh, Kiritbad Goda Nyanananda, who's a very well-known monk in Sri Lanka. And a uh, very, very remarkable monk. I'd heard a little bit about him before I went, but uh, I had no idea he was involved in this ceremony. And uh, he's a very beautiful chanter and just did this, he evolved his own chanting style and uh, very um, lilting, very simple and a lot of space in it and very contemplative chanting style and his Pali is exquisite so uh, you know just to listen to, to him chanting for 12 days without making any mistakes you know <laughs> is quite remarkable and uh, very, very beautiful, very beautiful experience to be able to, to, to do it in that way. And what, ha what happened actually, because his chanting was so nice, and uh, basically at the end of the ceremony, we all came together at the last day, and we all chanted the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta, the Buddha's first sermon, we all chanted together, all the different, different groups. And so after that there was a meeting, and all, all the other groups, except for the Burmese I have to add, but all the other groups apart from the Burmese, said how much they liked the Sri Lankan chanting style and they wanted to do it all like that next year. So, so they, they, were, they were thinking this was going to be such a big problem to, to get everybody chanting together, but they all enjoyed it so much that uh, that's what they all want to do next year. So I think that'll be very wonderful. So for me, it was, a, it was a, a, uh, quite an amazing experience to be able to... Um, Stay, you know, stay near the the um, the, Bo uh, the Mahabodhi temples, where to come and just do the chanting, just sit under the Bodhi tree and uh, just chanting every day, um, you know, through these you know suttas that I've you know been, read, been reading and, and and have loved for so long, uh, and for myself, I mean, just the direct, simple act of actually doing the chanting. And bringing your mind to that, bringing your mind back to that text and it was very, very valuable, you know, reminding myself again and again of these things and these essential teachings and, and noticing things which, yes, you know, but you need to be reminded of, you know, like these very important uh, passages which you, you're coming across again and again and again. How many times did we chant? We viche vaka mehi, we viche kusalehi dha mehi, savitakang savicharang, we veka jampiti sukhang patamang jahanang upasampadja viharati. These kinds of phrases, quite secluded from sensual desires, secluded from unwholesome dhammas, one enters and abides in the first jhana, and so on and so on through the formula for the four jhanas, and these things which appear in actually in almost every sutta in the Diga Nikaya talks about the four jhanas. And so you, you begin to realize how important, how central some of these teachings are. And uh, so, this was, this was, you know, the kind of the, 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 the kind of the basic experience or the main thing that was going on there. But of course, many things happening in the meantime, and I was very lucky to be able to stay in the same place in the Daijokyo temple, the Japanese temple, with the organizing committee. And so I got to know them quite well. And uh, very, very lovely people. And I was, I was quite amazed at how sincere they were and how 
just dedicated they were to, to doing this, even though they knew almost nothing about the Theravadan tradition. And, uh, you know, like, so we go down for breakfast, and because uh, none of them knew about offering food to monks, you know. So I was sort of down there at the breakfast table, and I just kind of just kind of sit around and wait till somebody passed the tea flask over. I sort of grab it and manage to get myself a cup of tea, and then someone passed the toast and managed to grab that and get myself some toast. And... Uh, so they, you know, they, they had no familiarity with the Theravadan tradition, but they were so willing to learn and so open to, to um, and, and interested in it, you know. And uh, even to the extent, I remember one thing that really stuck in my mind. We were sitting around talking, and they were talking about, they mentioned something about this Tibetan chanting festival and something, something. And then one of them said, oh yes, but now it's the Theravadan's time. Now we have to talk about the Theravadan things. I thought, wow, it's that's, that's really amazing that, 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 that they would do that. And, uh, you know, I could really see that there's such total sincerity in what they're trying to do. And, uh, you know, I was also quite very impressed on the other side with the, the, the main monks who are organizing it, Bhante Sivali and Bhante Yananda. And uh, I also got to know them quite well as well. And this is, of course, one of the advantages of being a monk is that, you know, you get to, you know, like when I was a, a, a musician, right, you got to kind of hang around backstage with the other musos and stuff, you know, so you, it's kind of the, the fringe benefit, so you get to meet all the other musos and hang out and so on. But this is the advantage of as, as being a monk is you get to hang out backstage with all the other monks and get to know them and stuff. And, uh, and then you fairly rapidly learn the difference between ones who are putting on a show for the public and the ones who are really sincere, you know, you get to actually see how they talk and how they think and what they do when they're in private as well as what they're like in public. And that's, you know, where I was quite amazed with, with these, these two monks, especially just how sincere they were in terms of their practice and, and, uh, and their dedication to the Dhamma. Uh, and I kind of had this, you know, these expectations that monks who are in maybe kind of administrative roles, like Bhante Sivali is kind of manager of a big temple, that, you know, perhaps he's not going to really be a meditator or really be that interested in practice, but that was very far from the truth. He's done very, a lot of very hard practice. He did like a year's retreat in Korea, you know, intensive meditation retreat and all of these kinds of things. So he's a lot of experience. And uh, Bhante Nyanananda, for those of you who don't know him, He's not very well known, I think, outside of Sri Lanka, but very remarkable monk. He originally ordained in 1979, and then in Sri Lanka they have a tradition where you sort of go down to novice precepts. So he became a samanera and like a novice precepts for many years. And during that time he did a lot of things. He did a very intensive study of the Pali Canon for many years, and so his knowledge of the, the Buddhist scriptures is quite immense. Uh, he also... Uh, spent a lot of time with uh, training and, and, and learning from and dialoguing with a lot of the Indi Hindu, sad Hindu sadhus in Rishikesh and places like that. And he used to sort of be seeking meditators and, and meditation guidance. So he went and spent a long time with them as well. And uh, he likes the kind of the Western monks because of our kind of spirit of inquiry. We're not too traditional. And so he, he kind of likes... Uh, people who challenge things and question things. I gave him a copy of my book, History of Mindfulness, and I said, oh, I said, you better be careful, Bhante, this is very controversial. And he said, oh, good. He said, good, oh, that's good, I like that, yeah. <laughs> and so he came down, next morning he came down, he said, oh, I read, I read, read, started reading your book, oh, it's very good, I really liked it. Trying to find the real Buddha's teachings. So this is what he's all about. It's just really trying to find the real Buddha's teachings, and it just sticks right to that. What actually did the Buddha, what was the Buddha teaching? What really was the Buddha teaching? And, uh, you know, he's quite, uh, you know, quite clear. You know, he says, you know, the Buddha didn't teach the Abhidhamma. This is not the Buddha's teaching. And he's very, very, uh, very uh, straightforward. And he's, he's got such a lot of metta and so, such a gentle person and, and very incredibly humble person, you know. But he, he reordained as a bhikkhu just a few years ago. I think about four, four years ago or something. And uh, Ajahn Samedo actually did the ordination in Sri Lanka. And uh, since then, he's, he's kind of gathered about 30 monasteries, about 300 disciples or something like that. And uh, so he sort of started this whole kind of movement in Sri Lanka, uh, which is he's quite independent and quite um, uh, uh, very, very active uh, movement there. So 
uh, having him involved with this ceremony was a very, very wonderful thing, very marvelous thing. And uh, so we really kind of hit it off. And uh, he would he would say a lot of things that, that uh, I, I would probably think but wouldn't kind of dare to say it, you know. And uh, so he's talking to somebody who's doing a meditation technique, like a Goenka technique or something. He said, oh, yes, 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 this is not really what the Buddha taught. He said, the Buddha taught samatha and vipassana, not just vipassana meditation, have samatha and vipassana. And anyway, this Goenka thing, this is not the real vipassana that the Buddha taught. <laughs> So they say these things in, in, in India where Goenka is like the, the thing in all of India, you know, and uh, it's very bold. And uh, so, very bold, but, but really sincere. So, you know, you can't, no, I don't, people, you know, people will, will they will just sort of, he, he, he just has this kind of knack of doing things, you know, he will just, he will just, just, you know, he has these stories like he would just talk to one of the little beggar boys or something like that, you know, for, 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 for a couple of minutes and then just ask him, you know, what's, do you want to be reborn? Is it, and then and this, this little beggar boy just started to crying. He said, I don't want to be reborn. He said, you want to find, find liberation, moksha. Yeah, I, I just don't want to be reborn in samsara again. And, uh, and he said, well, you must practice the Eightfold Path. And then the little boy just gets down on the ground and bows down and says, you know, you be my guru, you be my teacher. So he just has this, this effect on people, you know, he's quite, quite an amazing person. And the people here who know, know me know that I'm not the kind of the guru type, you know, I'm not, I'm not the type to, you know, go all kind of glazed eye, the, the kind of the latest fad that comes along. Um, but yeah, he's a very, very special monk, so I was very privileged to be able to see him. Hopefully he'll be coming to Australia next year. Uh, so... Um, Bhante Sivali and Bhante Nyanananda want to travel around uh, <clears throat> doing a bit of a world tour uh, next year to promote their Buddha Vision project, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. But, uh, so hopefully we'll see them here in Australia. I actually invited them to Bhante Nyanananda to come and do some chanting in our big cave. And so I said, please come and do some chanting in a big cave and we'll record it all properly and so on and make it into CDs and so on. So, Hopefully this will be happening next year. Uh, so I'd actually like to use his chanting style. You know, we can maybe maybe uh, get some. I'm not confident enough to be able to do it, but but uh, maybe we need, could get some CDs or something like that, and we could maybe learn to do his chanting style. Very 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 beautiful, very moving. So. It's kind of, I mean, it's similar, but he has, he, it's, it's just, it's a variety of the normal Sri Lankan style, but he, he does a particular way of doing it, which is, the Sri Lankan style is very nice, but, but it's a little bit anarchic, right? So everyone kind of does their own kind of thing a bit, you know, and it either works or it doesn't, whereas he, he's, he's stripped it back, so it's very simple, and, and everyone can sort of join in with the same, the same melody. I'll just give you an example, like for the Three Refuges or something like, Buddhang saranangachami Dhammang saranangachami Sanghang saranangachami Let's do it. <laughs> Eva's a convert. So, so, yeah. And you, I couldn't really notice the difference because we were sitting next to the Thai pavilion, okay? And the Thais had a very loud PA, right? So they were doing their style, which was kind of blasting out. And it was rocking. I mean, they were really rocking. They were moving, you know? And... Uh, <laughs> And we had this kind of very kind of slow kind of style, and and I could I could hear because you know I've been been studying and chanting Pali for many years now, so you can really hear in that juxtaposition because the Thai style is uh, is really artificially derived just from using Thai tones in Pali, 
And so it's actually quite an arbitrary kind of collision of two totally different languages. Thai and Pali have nothing in common with each other as languages. So it's like this collision, and the Thai style has emerged from that almost sort of arbitrarily or accidentally. Uh, so it's like kind of imposed on Pali, whereas this, this style is very much seen to me coming from within the language. You know, it's actually coming from the actual resonance and rhythm, the natural rhythm and resonance of the language itself. So, and I think, I think everybody that I spoke to kind of recognized this. And I, re I remember talking with Ajahn Brahm about this. Oh, he just, he just made a remark years ago. We went to some ceremony and, you know, the, the, the Tibetans sort of get up and... Then, and it's kind of a whole kind of still kind of auditorium and this and the thing. And then the, and the Chinese nuns got up and they did this very beautiful, I won't try to imitate Chinese nuns, but they did this very kind of beautiful, ethereal kind of chanting, you know. And then the, the, the Pali guys got up and got, Namo Tasa Bhagavata Ara. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of like, Atom Brahm said, I think we need a new chanting style. You know? <laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> so maybe we found it. So if, if that's going to become the standard one for the chanting ceremony, maybe we could also adopt it. <clears throat> so one of the interesting things that about what they're doing there, because I thought, oh, yeah, it's ceremony, chanting, it's nice to get them chant in Pali, but like, you know, so what, you know? But actually what they're doing is, is much deeper than, than that. They're actually using this as like a seed for redeveloping and revitalizing the Sangha and Buddhism in India. And so this is just like a focal point. And so now they're wanting to develop these like training colleges, Pali training colleges and, and Bhikkhu training colleges and things like that. And so this was all part of that kind of scheme. And actually Bhantanyanananda has committed to spending six months of the year in India to, to do this. So uh, there will be some quite remarkable changes happening. So while well, well, this kind of ceremony was going on, of course, you know, this being Bodh Gaya, then of course you meet lots of remarkable people there, you know. Now one of the, one of the things that happened, of course, because many of you know I have very dodgy knees, right? And so all the monks are kind of sitting on these platforms, right? And chanting, but I can't, I can't sit on the platform, I can't sit cross-legged, so I have to sit at the back of the platform, right, next to all the nuns, right? So, of course, yeah, the monks were sitting on these platforms and the Indian nuns were sitting on the ground next to the lay people, right? So, there's, it was a fairly bedraggled group of Indian nuns there, about five or six of them, just sitting on the ground. And then this Vietnamese bhikkhuni came along and she was great, she was very confident. She just said, I'm a bhikkhuni, I should sit on the, on the platform with the monks. And the monks go, oh, okay, uh, all right. <laughs> 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 so, uh, that's what she did. And... Uh, the monks were fine about it. Well, it wasn't really, it wasn't a problem. So, uh, and she was terrific. So, because I was sitting at the back of the uh, the group, then I got to know her quite well. And she'd been in India for 14 years or something like that, and taught herself Pali and so on. And she was just waiting to collect her PhD, and uh, in transforming consciousness or something like this. So. Uh, one, as one of the, the themes of my stay was I met all these very remarkable women and uh, all these remarkable bhikkhunis. I also met the, uh, the entire bhikkhuni sangha of Indonesia, which was two, <laughs> Theravadan bhikkhuni sangha of Indonesia. So uh, they were there. And uh, again, two very, very remarkable women. And I asked them, I said, do you, do you ever have any problems with the monks in Indonesia? She said, no, no, no. She said, Sometimes the monks have problems with us, but we don't have any problems with them. No? <laughs> and she said, one of the monks, Indonesian monks, said that if you give dana to the bhikkhunis, then you go to hell. Mm. Believe that, if you will. So they were, they've been doing really amazing work in, in Indonesia and uh, really doing a lot of teaching and social work, disaster relief, all kinds of things, setting up a center and and I said to them, you know, you, you make sure you get enough time for your own practice. And, and they said, yeah, that's why we're here in Bodh Gaya. So they're actually sitting meditation all night under the Bodhi tree every night, you know. And uh, it was just a coincidence that they were there at the time of the chanting ceremony, you know. So I got to meet them. And then I met this very lovely Bhutanese bhikkhuni as well, the only bhikkhuni from Bhutan. And uh, she was also very, very interesting. And we had a, had a chat one time about 
she was talking about the situation. She said in Bhutan it's very different because it's matrilinear succession there. So the, the, the woman, the daughter, in, inherits everything from the family. And she said the, the men all complain that they don't get a fair treatment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she was telling me about the system they have there for the support of the Sangha and these kinds of things. So it's quite, quite interesting to, to hear about. She said in Bhutan, they, they, um, the, the culture, they really criticize anybody who makes too much money. You know? So if you start to, start to get a bit above yourself and making too much money, then they'll start to sort of mutter and they'll say, oh, you're making enough for two lifetimes, are you? <laughs> and so this is... Uh, yeah, it was very nice, to, very nice to, to see her and get some kind of feel for what was going on. So all these kind of remarkable uh, women practicing in Buddhism. I uh, also met Sister Tita Meda, a Russian nun from uh, Chithurst, and uh, spent quite a lot of time together. But also at the same time, you know, I was hearing these very kind of positive stories. Also I was hearing all these incredibly negative stories from a lot of other women about their encounters with Buddhism and it was quite quite a coincidence because I got this email uh, I managed to check my emails once or twice while I was there and I got this email from this this woman who had been a, a Mechi like a eight precept nun in, in Thailand Western woman New Zealander and uh, she was just had been very deeply traumatized by her experience there and uh, the whole the whole way that the women are treated and uh, you know, you could see that there was this very, very, she was very, very sincere in her practice. You know, all she just just wants to, to, to meditate and practice the Dhamma, and uh, you know, just going there and just realizing how how badly uh, they were thought of and treated and so on because of uh, you know their status, just as being women. She said that before she went there, you know, being a woman meant nothing. You know, she was just you just live your life, and and it's just like, you know. Never, met, never, never made any difference to her before she went there. But then she went, and it was just totally different. And uh, she just couldn't, uh, you know, find any sense of being supported or anything in the practice, you know. And then, you know, even though she was very, very sincere, but, but still, you know, well, you know, she's having to bow to these monks, and she, she knows what the monks are doing, and a lot of them not very well behaved at all, you know. And so you see monks who are not doing good things, you know, maybe watching porn or. Uh, you know, having girlfriends and uh, drinking and all of these kinds of things, and then you're still supposed, supposed to treat them as if they're somehow gods or something like that. And so, at the same time as I got this email, and, and it's quite, found it quite moving, and then I sort of started to meet some other women in, in Bodh Gaya who also had been in, in Thailand and had been Mechis or long term Ubasikas, lay women, and they're also, you know, starting to hear the same stories again and again. And I would hear these stories again and <laughs> I'd say, you know, this is just exactly what I've been reading on this. Exactly the same kind of pattern. And I, I think with some of them that there's, uh, I don't know, maybe some kind of karmic connection or something like that. But it's almost like a kind of willful self-harming is what I came to think. It's almost like anorexia or something. Being a, being a Western Mechi in Thailand is almost, <laughs> it's, it's like it's, it's you know, so obviously damaging, and yet they sort of still do. They still go back, and uh, maybe if there's some connection from the past or something like that, it seems very hard to break away in some cases. But uh, yeah, I mean, this kind of thing, you know, goes all the way from, you know, just being neglected and not being given respect, all the way up to being raped, you know. And this is the in, in the monastery. You know, so you hear these stories. You hear the story of a nun being raped in the monastery by the monks. And, uh, you know, what can you do about it? You can't do anything. And abused, abused wives. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is there a big um, around the world? Around the world? In, well, in, in, uh, in, obviously in the Korea and Taiwan and so on there is, yeah. Korea and Taiwan, there's tens of thousands of bikinis. In Vietnam, uh, in Theravadan countries, only small at the moment, maybe 500 in Sri Lanka. But they are uh, concentrated together in one bikini place. In Sri Lanka, I think they have a few places now. I'm not sure exactly what they're what, what they're doing, but they have a few places in Sri Lanka. Yeah, I asked Bhante Sivali about this, and uh, I, I, no, I didn't ask him about that. I just asked him generally. I said, how's 
things going in Sri Lanka with the Sangha and Buddhism in Sri Lanka. And he said, oh, not very good. He said, the monks are really kind of going downhill and the practice is very bad and monks, a lot of monks disrobing and so on. He said, now the lay people prefer to go to the bhikkhunis for all their ceremonies and talks and things like that. And uh, for the all-night parit chanting, they get the bhikkhunis to come and do that. And like, I don't know if I should tell the story of Chandra and his all-night parit chanting that he invited the monks to go to many years ago. I'll leave that for another time. Chandra used to, when he was a student in Sri Lanka, he used to prepare specific, special medicinal medicinal requ- requirements for the monks to actually help them get through their, their all-night chanting with the medicinal requirements, included large doses of whiskey to, to, to lubricate the, <laughs> the chanting experience. This is kind of student pranks, but... <clears throat> uh, so... You know, these, these things were going on and, 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 you know, I started hearing about these things and hearing, you know, it's not just, uh, you know. And, and what, what, one of the things that struck me was, was how people would react when, when I listened to them and actually said, oh, yeah, that's how it is, you know. And they were like, you know, you're the first monk. Who's ever done this, you know? I met Sister Tita Maida. Somebody introduced us. She said, oh, this is Ajahn Sajata. She said, oh, Ajahn Sajata, you're famous. You're the monk who likes, who supports nuns. <laughs> I'm like, sorry, I hope I'm not the only one. There must be, there must be another one somewhere. And I, I'm, I'm sure there are, you know. I'm sure I'm not the only one who, who, who does this. But it is just remarkable how, you know, the women even in, in Western monasteries... Uh, just feel that, that they're not listened to, that nobody's interested or, or wants to pay attention or try to do anything to help them. And it's just a story I hear again and again and again. And so um, this was a large part of my time in Bodh Gaya, was listening to stories of women suffering <laughs> and uh, their, different, their pain and so on that they're going through. So... Uh, One of the good outcomes of this, in fact, a very wonderful outcome of this, uh, at um, towards the end of the stay there, this, this tour group came through, led by a, a fellow called Shantam Seth, who's a, an Indian but a, a student of Thich Nhat Hanh. And he's a kind of a Dhamma teacher in Thich Nhat Hanh's lineage. And he uh, was leading a group of Americans through, mostly Americans, through on pilgrimage. And they were staying in the same temple as we were. And as it happened, one of the people on the pilgrimage was not American, it was Cecilia, who used to be with Mitra in Sydney, so I, I knew her quite well. And I uh, got to know them. And uh, Shantam had actually been asked, Thich Nhat Hanh had told him, you know, you re-establish Buddhism in India. Okay? He didn't say you try to re-establish Buddhism in India, he said you re-establish Buddhism in India. And so he had this kind of mission from his teacher, and he was sort of trying to do what he could to do that. And, one day, one night, we got together with the organising committee, with Wang Mo and and Richard and so on, and with uh, Bhante Sivali and Yanananda, and we were talking about their plans. And so they want to set up a. They have a, a little bit of land in Bodh Gaya over on the Sujata village side, where they want they have they want to set up very simple place, just build out of bamboo, some huts and so on out of bamboo, and set up a little training place for the bhikkhus to stay and, and practice their pali and so on for the chanting and. and Bhante Nyanananda wants to train 200 monks for next year's ceremony. And Shantam said, uh, do you have, you know, have you got any plans to make a, somewhere for the nuns as well, for the bhikkhunis? And, uh, and they said, yes, we've, we, we've already talked about this and we would like to do something for the bhikkhunis as well. And he said, well, actually, I've got a little piece of land in Bodh Gaya which I'd like to offer for that. And so this kind of got us thinking now, as it turns out, Shantam's land is actually very small, probably too small to do anything with, but at least it got us sparked off. And next morning, I went down to the Bodh Gaya temple where I met this Vietnamese bhikkhuni, and I said, hey, you know, this, this kind of thing has happened, and I want to start a bhikkhuni training center. And she said, oh, well, she's just been talking with this Indian nun, Indian bhikkhuni, and they were talking about maybe starting a bhikkhuni training center, but they didn't have any land or any sponsors or supporters. I said, right, okay. So we just tried desperately to network within a couple of days and had a couple of meetings. And eventually we had a, had a meeting in the Mahabodhi Society with myself, Bhante Nyanananda, Bhante Sivali, Bhante um, Prajnadeep, who's from the All India Bhikkhu Sangha. 
uh, and the two Indonesian bikinis, uh, this Vietnamese bikini whose name I can't pronounce in Vietnamese, so I call the uh, Chanda Padma in the Pali translation of her name. And uh, Sister Tita Meda and a couple of the lace people were there. And so we had this meeting where we all decided, okay, we'll start a bikini training center in Bodh Gaya. He said, okay, everyone in agreement said, right, let's do it. Well, so we're all the founding, we we'll, we'll be the founding members, okay, we'll do it. And so that's it, now we've done it. And we made this whole series of resolutions about what we want to do and we set up this place where uh, specifically for training of bikunis and um, not a tourist place. So even though it's at Bodh Gaya, there's no guests allowed or anything like that. And the bikunis have to go there and commit themselves for a period of time uh, to learn, study in both Hindi and English. Uh, and mainly for the Indian nuns who can go there, learn, and then, and then be teaching and, and are supporting the Indian community because there's very, very little dhamma for the Indian community. This is one of the things that became very apparent to me. Most of the people who come through India, the, the Buddhist groups, they just come and teach in their, their native language for, for their own people. Even the Tibetans have done very little to, to teach the Indians. This was really struck, struck me one time. I was talking to one of the Tibetan nuns. She came from a monastery in the south of India and she said there's like 3,000 or something monks in this monastery and she said the Dalai Lama came down and was speaking with the abbot and asked them, do you do any teaching for the local people? And he said, no. He said, well, you must do. You must teach the local people. And I assumed that he meant the local Indian people, but they asked and they said, no, 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 they're, they're Tibetans. It was actually the local Tibetan people that he met, like the local Tibetan refugees. And even them... And they're not even getting any teaching from the monks. The only ones who get teachings are the Westerners. <laughs> and even, even the Tibetans aren't getting any teachings, not to, to say nothing of the Indians. And so uh, that you know, hasn't been working, working very well on that level. And so we need to really kind of... There is a lot of interest in India. And so we need to try to do something to help in that regard. So, you know, as things happen in India, the... the um, costs of things is not great. It's not going to be a huge cost to actually set up a centre like that. Uh, but finding the people and so on will be more difficult. But I'm very confident, especially with, with uh, Bhante Nyanananda involved and some of the other very good people, that uh, should be quite possible. One of the good signs was that as we were having this meeting, uh, then the organisers from the uh, Light of Buddha Dhamma Foundation were also having a series of meetings with the local government, the state government, and they've now kicked out Lalu and his cronies who were kind of the corrupt state government for about 15 years and they've now got a really good government who are really um, uh, are very pro-Buddhist and pro-development and so on and so forth. So they actually invited us to, make, to approach them and make a, uh, offering for, uh, make a request for land, government land and these kinds of things. So uh, this was very, yeah, it was very good. So many, many things have, so many things happened which were really good. We met, this, this Indian Swami came along and he was a very, very funny Swami, very lovely guy, very, very gentle, loved the Bodh guy, loved, he said, every time I sit under the Bodhi tree, I see it and my, my tears come down my eyes. I was sitting there crying under the Bodhi tree and uh, he, he, uh, he said, oh, he said, when I, when I levitate, when I, when, I, when I sit meditation, I levitate, you know, about this far off the ground. He said, do you want to see? I can do that. <laughs> no, it's, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. And, uh, and you know, we were talking about some of the things we're doing. And he said, oh, he's the, he's the yoga teacher for the chief minister of the state. So the next morning he rang up the chief minister and you know, told him about what we're doing and so on. So all of these things were happening. It was very wonderful. So anyway, we had this very nice meeting and had a very great degree of, of harmony among the people there. And then at the end of it, I, I said, okay, because Bhante Nyanananda had to leave and we had said, okay, we'll have a um, photo. So we went next door into the Mahabodhi temple to have the photo. Now, a couple of weeks beforehand, they'd had a very big ceremony there and His Holiness the Dalai Lama had been there to inter the relics of Sariputta and Moggallana, who many of you maybe have heard of. These are the relics that were found in Sanchi uh, and which were paraded all around the Buddhist world in the Buddha Jayanti celebrations and taken around with these kind of roll down the streets and these big ceremonies in Singapore and all over these different capitals and these relics, which are actually the real relics of Sariputra and Moggallana taken from the stupa in Sanchi, which were interred over 2,000 years ago. And also some of the most 
uh, precious Buddha relics from Sri Lanka. And so His Holiness put them in. And so Dante Sivali, of course, since he's the boss of the Mahabodhi Society, got the keys. And these things are hidden in a vault underneath the shrine. And so he had to like, get a couple of guys to lift the slab out. So first of all, you lift the kind of slab out because it's been concealed in this marble. And then there's these iron grates with padlocks on them. So we had to kind of open these padlocks. And everyone's kind of gathering around and peering around. And we're all there. And then go down these things and then climb down into this under this vault underneath the Buddha Rupa and the safe and sort of get into the safe and open and take out these beautiful uh, relic containers wrapped in silk. And so we all kind of took them out and then all the bhikkhunis were holding these and then we took the photos. So this was our photo for the starting of the bhikkhuni training center. Yeah? So how can it possibly fail? Yeah. Yeah. So this was uh, some of my experiences in Bodh Gaya. So uh, very po positive and very, very... Uh, I had no idea any of these kinds of things would happen. And uh, I know because Sister Tita Maida was there from Chithurst and afterwards she was just kind of laughing. She's saying, what am I going to tell the nuns in Chithurst <laughs> what I've been landed into now? And uh, so, yeah, so I've, I've, anyway, I can say I've made, I made a commitment to go back every year and uh, take part in the ceremony and also do some teaching for oh. the Bikuni Centre if, if and when it starts up or when it starts up. And also be really good to bring some of the people from Sydney to come along. And many people have mentioned that uh, they'd love to go to India for the pilgrimage tour. And I think it's much, this way of doing it is much nicer than just uh, travelling around on buses all day and popping into a, you know, one of the sites. And So maybe we'll think about how we want to organise it for next year, but certainly I think if it would be a very good thing to do, go there and once you're there, of course, you, know, you can travel to see the other sites if you want to. Uh, or people want to stay there, but because the great advantage is you can just fly straight into Gaia out of, out of Bangkok and, and spend the time there doing the chanting ceremony. So I'd like to, certainly like to bring some of the Sangha from Santi, and I think it's a wonderful education for them. Uh, and uh, if any of the lay people are interested as well, so maybe we'll think about how to organize that for next year. So this is my talk for you this evening on my experiences in India. And I offer this to you for your reflection. <laughs>